Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren McKenzie and I'll be kicking off this panel. I'll begin with about 10 minutes of some macro level efforts to integrate WPS at the Marine Corps University. And I'll be followed by my colleague, Dr. Claire Metellitz, who will zero in to some really interesting, a little bit more micro level initiatives at the Command and Staff College. Um, but first, just by way of background, uh, Marine Corps University is located in Quantico, Virginia. It's a university comprised of several degree granting schoolhouses at the captain major and lieutenant colonel level. We also have um, an enlisted college. We have a college of distance education, uh, library, et cetera. So it is a, a relatively large uh, university, uh, certainly not as large as um, the War College, at least as this one. Uh, but we'd like to just talk a little bit about some of our efforts to integrate WPS over the past several years. And uh, by no means do we have the answer uh, but what we'd like to do is share some things that have worked well for us in the hopes of, of maybe garnering your input, uh, in hopes of collaboration, and in hopes of if any of the ideas resonate with you and you'd like to expand upon them in your own context at your own institution, um, you know, we'd love to help with that. Um, so what can you expect from the next 20 minutes, the first half of the panel? Um, so first, I'll kick off by talking about a couple of efforts to um, integrate WPS across the university. So if you're anything um, like us at, at your institution, we tend to be a little bit siloed. So our captain school, our command and staff college, our war college, uh, they tend to, to be uh, a little bit stovepiped at times. So one of the things that I've been working on since about 2015 are some efforts that can help be the connective tissue across the respective schools and centers at Marine Corps University. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about a writing award that we instituted in 2017, uh, open to all students across the university to include our enlisted college, to include our uh, distance education um, college. Um, for there, we'll move on to a relatively new program designed to bring together students, faculty, and staff from across our schools and centers to gather once a month uh, for a discussion pertaining to WPS broadly uh, to enjoy a free lunch provided by our foundation and of course to network uh, with each other because it isn't often that our students get to collaborate across the different learning levels. And then I'll conclude with just a few kind of lessons learned uh, from my efforts to offer faculty development again across the university, some things that have worked well and, and maybe not so well. And there, from there on, I'll turn it over to Dr. Metellitz to talk about some of the great work that she's done at Command and Staff College. Um, so first things first, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of grassroots, right? So as has been alluded to several times already today, when things come down from above and are pushed on us as faculty, as staff, right, it, it doesn't tend to go as well as when it comes from the grassroots. So back in 2017 at MCU, we invited uh, Dr. Nayla Arnas from NDU, who at the time, to my knowledge, had the only WPS Writing Award in the PME context. She spoke to us a little bit about that. And uh, one of the EWS, our Expeditionary Warfare School uh, instructors, Blake Jackson, said, we need to replicate that here. And oh, by the way, he said, I happen to be an officer for NNOA, the National Naval Officers Association, which is devoted to um, sort of promoting and supporting minority officers. So he said, I think we'll have the money so we'll have the resources if you at MCU can provide the judges and, and things like that. So that was how uh, we got our first writing award started from that fact dev. So this is uh, this slide is not meant to be read uh, word for word. I know there's a ton of text there, but this is the one pager, the call for papers, if you will, that again, I'm happy to share with you. I'll have our email addresses at the end. I can send you this one page as a Word doc or a PDF, but it just sort of showcases our attempt to attract and reward solid student research and writing devoted to WPS. And, and I should say, I mean, some of our winners have been uh, papers about masculinity. I mean, it's not all about gender. Many of our winners over the years have not had the acronym WPS a single place in the entire paper. So we are really, we try to be broad and inclusive in the way that we attract student research and writing and, and reward it. Um, so this just tells you a little bit about the $600 
prize. Again, it's a 300, 200, and 100 prize respectively. And I bring that up because I just think the strategic messaging, these student award winners get recognized at our commencement. And what a great way to, to showcase st strategic importance of WPS other than at the commencement when we sometimes we'll have the commandant of the Marine Corps, we'll have a lot of general officers and again, all the friends and family and faculty. So a great place to say, hey, MCU recognizes the value of WPS and we put money where our mouth is, right? We recognize and reward it. So this is just a little bit about the selection criteria, the judging and notification and the submission guidelines. So I, I put this up here just because I didn't want to talk in broad generalities. I wanted to give you something specific that I'm more than happy to share with you. And I'm well aware also we're no longer the only uh, game in town. All the schoolhouses um, I think across PME now have some version of this. So it could be a little bit old news, but if you are looking to, again, institutionalize a WPS writing award at your school or center, or just to revise or update yours, uh, please email me. I would love to talk to you about some of the experiences we've had, some success. One other thing I will add, because my uh, co-editor is here, Lieutenant Colonel Dana Perkins, oh, is a colonel now. Oh, God, sorry, you got promoted without me. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. So we, what we did was we formed a small committee and we asked all the PME schoolhouses across the U.S. to send us their top WPS Writing Award papers. And then we had a best of the best competition where we brought together all the papers, got a great panel of expert judges, and we picked a top winner, um, which was, I think, exciting in and of itself. But also we were able with the support of our Marine Corps University Press, we were able to compile those award-winning papers into a book or an edited volume that came out last year. So we're real proud of that. And again, just a way to recognize great student work. All right, so that's there at your disposal if you'd like it. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up, because I think it also emphasizes um, our desire to collaborate and to focus on um, not just on the down and in, which is so tempting for us all in our own work to really focus down and in, but, but to go up and out, because we're always trying to balance that. Uh, this is the creation of a WPS uh, scholars program. So again, this is not meant to be read word for word. This is just a slide that shows you the front page of a publication that came out last month in the the Marine Corps Gazette. And one of the things I learned about the Marine Corps when I joined the faculty in 2015 and that I, I truly admire is that they have this publication, the Gazette, where they can exchange ideas and share, you know, criticisms and they can share new initiatives um, and respond to each other. And, and it happens in a pretty timely fashion. So this came out last month, March of 2023, where Dr. Metellitz and I and our colleague, Brad Weinman, were able to publish the inaugural year of this WPS Scholars Program. And I'll just say uh, it's now been renamed the Reynolds Scholars Program. And that's really important uh, because when General Val Jackson invited us to be part of uh, a series of different scholars programs at MCU, we have the Gray Scholars, the Krulak Scholars, we didn't have any named after female generals and retired Lieutenant General um, Lori Reynolds uh, spent most of her career devoted and committed to communicating the idea that diversity is a strength. And when we leave, you know, strength and talent on the bench, you know, we're only hurting ourselves. And so uh, with some collaboration across the university, we decided to rename the WPS Scholars Program, the Reynolds Scholars. And I can tell you as a person who um, whose organization was canceled by the Marine Corps, I initially was hired as a part of the CAOCL, the Center for Advanced Operational Culture Learning, our culture center. Uh, the Marine Corps divested itself of the culture center. Culture was no longer relevant uh, to the Marine Corps, apparently. And so in 2020, uh, we went away. And one of the things that Dr. Metellus and I wanted to ensure didn't happen is that when WPS if it goes away, God forbid, right, that that our efforts don't die with it. And so no one is ever going to cancel in the Marine Corps, General Mattis, General Gray, General Krulak, or General Reynolds. And so this just gave us, I think, some really important staying power. So if you have any interest in sort of what we did um, in terms of developing this program, delivering it, and the future directions of the program, this article in the Marine Corps Gazette from March 23 uh, chronicles those efforts. And so again, uh, we're proud of it. It's a work in progress. It's not perfect, but every month we get together and we ask the hard questions and, and we connect with each other. All right, my last minute 
I just want to say a couple of things that I've learned um, as I've tried uh, with the help of my colleagues to offer faculty development opportunities at Marine Corps University. Uh, one thing is for me, like, I have to always keep in mind that the distinction between reaction and response. So the common reactions I would get since I started doing this some time ago is, um, and I quote, I'm so sick of this squishy culture shit, or I'm so sick of this squishy gender shit, um, I, or two, I've already taken my sexual harassment training, um, or three, please don't give me another rock in the pack. My pack is full and heavy and, and I'm falling over because of the weight. And so I think that that reaction is, it's fair and it's valid. Uh, but as I would like to quote our current director, Colonel Brad Tippett at Command and Staff College, and he said, if there's one thing that we'd like you to think about this academic year is thinking about the weight of your pack and what in your pack doesn't serve you anymore. If there is a new idea, you could replace that old rock that's been weighing you down right? and think about something in a new way. And I think that's what WPS is about. It helps us give, give us new tools for causal analysis, for red teaming, for emotional intelligence, for critical thinking, all the stuff you've heard already today. Um, so that's been important for us to think about WPS as you know, another way for Marines and our students to become more resourceful. And if that's one thing that we're after with our 10 months that we have for them is we want to help them become more resourceful in their thinking, in their analysis. And then finally, ooh, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Metellitz. Um, this is a quote from retired General Mike Dana, who said that the way that you see the problem may be the problem. Um, and I've noticed that um, not only for my students and my faculty with WPS, but for myself. Um, so over the years, I've really had to work hard to try to see it from a different angle, from a faculty that does always have a lot being pushed down upon them. Um, and we try to think of creative ways to work in WPS through essay prompts, uh, through discussion questions, through issues for consideration that aren't just another reading, another speaker or another module, but a way to integrate it seamlessly into the curriculum. So let me stop there. Thanks so much for your attention. I'll turn it now to Dr. Metellitz, who will talk about some specific efforts at the Command and Staff College. Okay. Uh, my name is Claire Metellitz. I uh, am a faculty member with Dr. McKenzie um, at Command and Staff College. I uh, A lot of the things that were discussed in the previous uh, panel um, are going to be familiar uh, in, in this presentation, but I'll just, I'm going to highlight how ours is different. Um, so, at Command and Staff College, uh, as one of the colleges at Marine Corps University, we have uh, we have about 250 students at Command and Staff. So it's relatively large. So that's every year, including about 40 international officers. Uh, and every January, the students have to take some electives. And this is the best part of the year because it's when we get to teach what we like um, and what we're good at supposedly, and uh, the students get to take what they want. So uh, the past three years, my background is I'm an Africanist and I study conflict. So gender uh, WPS uh, is something that Lauren introduced me to when I got to Marine Corps University. Um, but for the past three years, I have, uh, I devised a, an elective. So very much like, um, uh, like Joan did, uh, I, you know, I have a class. Um, and again, this is small print, I understand that, but uh, I will go over some of the lessons and point out how my class is a bit different because, uh, because all of my students um, are military, I wanted to make sure that it was highly relevant. So I, um, but I also love theory, so I, I wanted my my own kind of interest in there as well, um, as we tend to do as academics. Uh, so what I did with uh, the gender war and security class, um, and it's been surprisingly successful. Um, always, always, uh, at least half of the class is always men, um, and I get everything from infantry to artillery to uh, uh, like medical officers. Um, but one of the things that I did for the elective was I made half of the lessons operational and half of them academic. 
which so each, you know, there's an A and O by each lesson, you get 10 lessons for the elective. So I do similar things to uh, to the elective that was discussed in the last panel. I do things like what is WPS? I talk about militarized masculinity, norms, tropes, things like that. But I also talk about uh I, I also talk about things like how do you operationalize WPS? How do you do it, right? What does it actually look like? And because I have never been a gender advisor um, and the only qualification I have is that I have a uterus, right? Uh, that I have, so what I do is I get, I have speakers come in um, who have either been, you know, gender advisors. I have people from OSD. I have um, uh, I had Dr. Brown come in and talk about how she implemented, uh, WPS in, in, uh, the, the college where she is in Canada. Um, so I have speakers come and talk about the stuff that I'm not an expert in. Um, so at least five of the classes, right. Um, they do a gender analysis and they do it in class and then they have to do it as a paper, things like that. So this is, um, I've been surprised uh, that I always have skeptics when I come in um, and, uh, you know, even folks are like, I don't know about this gender stuff. Right. But uh, they they always they always, you know, come out of it, um, if not having fully bought into it. Right. Um, realizing that there is so much more um, to this topic. Um, okay, so that is an elective. And again, I'm just kind of giving you like the nitty gritty of what what uh, a lot of us are doing at Command and Staff College. Um, all right. The last couple of years, I, uh, and it's sad to say, but I've been able to, I've talked people into letting letting us do WPS in the planning and warfighting exercises. Um, and so it's been a bit of a win um, and it gets better every year. Uh, but this is actually where, you know, where at the end of the year, and it starts Monday, we have this culminating exercise that lasts the entire month and the entire student body are in it. Um, they all have billets um, and we're fighting some fake country that really is China, right? Um, but uh, what I, what we do now is I have gender focal points. And uh, so each each task force gets a gender focal point and I get to play the gender advisor at the, the COCOM. Um, and what I've done with students in the past couple of years is we've come up with like a fact book, like a fake fact book, right? For this fake place, right? Using very obvious um, disaggregated data from, from some other place, right? And, uh, what we do is we, I, I just work with the students on here's, here's how you do, uh, you know, here's where gender advisors or a gender analysis comes into it in um, the JIPO brief, right? Or here's how it comes into when you're just doing a PBC and that's kind of an easy one. But, uh, and then they go to different task force groups, like working groups, like the targeting group, the strat, you know, strategic ops group, things like that. Um, and they just advise. And, and a lot of them um, are hesitant to do this, right? Because it's kind of like, I don't want to push it. And I'm just like, just push it, just push it, right? Um, challenge, yes. But a lot of it comes, a lot of success comes from having high level support. And once you talk uh, the, uh, you know, the retired generals who come and do their, you know, play commander, um, which is wonderful. Uh, once you brief them and get them to understand why this is important stuff, um, then the students buy into it. So having, having top cover is really, really important. Um, all right. I, I'll, you know, if you have questions about this, I, and we come up with documents, things like that, like we've created things, not really knowing kind of what, what is supposed to be done. Um, but it's like, it's like, you know, building the airplane as it, as it's flying. 
Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, my last point is that uh, we've also uh, integrated WPS into the civilian led curriculum and very much like, um, uh, like Susan said in the previous uh, the presentation, um, it's, we do put them in lesson cards, right? I sort of made it, I got, I got folks to be like, all right, minimum requirement, five of the lesson cards this year of the, I don't know, 30 some we have, uh, should have WPS or some sort of aspect of diversity or intersectionality or, um, and, and by that, I don't mean just readings, right? You can have readings, but to me, that's just, you know, like, adding women in stirring, you know, the article, uh, it's just, you know, numbers, but you can have readings, you can have discussion questions. Um, but I really agree, uh, with, with Joan and the fact that teaching the faculty about this is probably the very first, you know, step because they're not going to be comfortable. Um, so getting their buy-in is very important. Um, but, and, you know, really it comes down to as a as a faculty member, as a teacher, understanding how to integrate it, not just as a standalone class, right, but how to just integrate it in your seminar, right? Just, you know, throw a question out there that has to do with it. Or what would this look like if you were, you know, X population or, you know, how do you think this affects, you know, women in Ukraine, things like that, right? So um, there's lots of there's lots of ways to do this. Um, again, I completely, you know, I agree with the, everything that was said in terms of um, how to kind of, it doesn't have to be a standalone kind of like, now we're gonna talk about WPS, right? I agree with what was said before um, in that sense, but uh, there are, I'm also of the of the uh, of the opinion that you know sometimes you just you just gotta you just gotta put it in there, and people aren't going to be happy. <laughs> but we've gone for years with not being happy with not having it. So um, so I think that you know this is this is steps forward, um, and I'm going to leave it at that so that uh, so that Dr. Brown and my Canadian colleagues can can go. Yes. Oh, sorry. Steps forward. Um, here is our email address, uh, addresses. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to share my syllabus. Lawrence, happy to share the writing award stuff. We also have uh, a WPS charter framework that we actually borrowed from uh, the Naval War College from Brenda Operman. Who was ha who was nice enough to give it to us um, because we should be sharing this stuff, not kind of like it's not copywritten, right? So anyway, let us know if you need anything. Okay, that was fantastic. Round of applause. Um, okay, our next presenters are from the Canadian Defense Academy, and we have Dr. Vanessa Brown, uh, Mr. Bjorn Lagerlöf, and Miss Christine Saint Pierre. So you have the stage. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to both of you for the great presentation. Um, uh, hello and good afternoon. It's our pleasure to be here at the US Naval War College as part of this important symposium on women, peace and security. I'm Christine St. Pierre and I'm a, a gender advisor with the Canadian Defense Academy and I'm joined here um, by my two colleagues, Dr. Vanessa Brown, Assistant Professor at the Canadian Forces College, and Bjorn Lagerlof, who is Senior Advisor uh, to the Commander at the Canadian uh, Defense Academy. And our, present, our presentation today will focus on the work that we have been doing at the Canadian Defense Academy to mainstream women, peace and security, as well as gender-based analysis plus as part of the work of uh, the Defense Academy and defense education. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so Canada, as uh, the United States and as uh, many other nation 
nations around the world have uh, committed to uh, integrate women, peace and security, the women, peace and security agenda or framework um, through uh, adopting national action plans. And Canada's first national action plan was um, implemented in 2010 and our second one in, in 2017. And um, now the national action plan was uh, was really a, a a, a catalyst in terms of uh, helping or su supporting the different departments within Canada to integrate uh, women, peace and security. And, and one of these departments is certainly the Department of Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, and so in 2016, uh, the Department of National Defense adopted a specific directive for integrating Resolution 1325 and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda into Canadian Armed Forces planning and operations, as well as across its institutions. So this includes the implementation of gender-based analysis plus as a tool for integrating um, both women, peace and security and gender perspectives across the department and the armed forces. In addition, Canada's uh, defense policy also includes a clear commitment to advancing diversity, respect and inclusion, including striving for gender equality, within the organization and in all of its domestic and international activities and operations. Um, now, as part of uh, these specific commitments, the Canadian Armed Forces have also specifically committed to increasing the proportion of women in the military by improving recruitment, retention, train, and training of personnel. But certainly what we've uh, what we've learned over the, the last, uh, certainly the last decade, is that there are important systemic barriers that require our attention. If women are to have influence within the organization and are to be equitably supported for career advancement and for deployment to um, both in, in domestic and international operations. And so Turning it now to the Canadian Defence Academy, um, we view defence education at all levels um, as playing a critical role in helping to address these systemic barriers in a meaningful and sustainable way. And so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Lagaloff, who's going to talk more about the Canadian Defence Academy context. Great, thanks so much. So as uh, Ms. St. Pierre pointed out, there are a lot of policy imperatives as well as uh, international agreements to which Canada is party, um, which give us, you know, I think it's safe to say enough policy cover to proceed with uh, advancing WPS through the department. The reason why CDA or the Canadian Defence Academy is such a uh, pivotal, uh, I think, player in that space uh, is because we're effectively at the center of professional development for the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, we have four core roles within the Canadian Armed Forces and Department of National Defense. Uh, and because of those four different roles, uh, we're able to take a more systematic approach to, uh, to mainstreaming uh, WPS and applying gender perspectives through the uh, professional development system. Uh, and that includes from a policy direction, curriculum, uh, content delivery perspective. So uh, it allows us to be a lot more comprehensive. Uh, the first role, as you see represented behind me, uh, it's really covering off uh, the CDA formation as an organization itself. So uh, my boss, Major General Aitchison, is the commander of a command. So the CDA formation has four colleges within it, uh, two pre-commissioning academies, uh, one NCO academy, and then a command and staff college. Uh, and so that is one role that that person has to carry out. Um, Next to that is his role as a training authority for all CAF common professional development. Uh, beyond that is his role as the functional authority for professional development. So between those two roles, uh, that gives the academy control over things like requirements. Uh, it was an interesting discussion on requirements in the last panel, how those are set, how those are formed. And uh, from our perspective now, 
uh, when we sit a requirements writing board or a qualification standards writing board in Canadian forces language, uh, we bring in a gender advisor or other experts to inform how we are drafting those requirements that then get tr uh, transmitted down to the schools. Uh, and I know that's something my colleague, Dr. Brown, will talk about in her part of this. Uh, beyond that as well, we're looking at the policies that are uh, around student uh, loading onto courses. So what are the student population um, uh, mixes that we have at each college? Uh, what are the barriers that might be in place for students uh, from an access perspective, uh, and so on and so forth. We're also looking at some of our programs to look at the way in which they're being delivered. Uh, are they being delivered equitably? Are there barriers to success? Those kinds of things are the questions that we're asking ourselves. And so all of those responsibilities added up really provide us with a, a very I think a uh, good opportunity to advance WPS especially and to incorporate gender perspectives uh, across all of what we do. Um, I know my colleague, uh, Ms. St. Pierre can elaborate a bit more on, on how we do that specifically uh, and some of the frameworks we've put in place to advance that through our gender focal point network. Uh, yes, yeah, so one of the things that we've um, done in the last two years is kind of really look at the, the structure within CDA and how we can implement a gender structure um, in a similar way um, or, or taking from the NATO and the, the UN experience. And so um, it's really a way of that we've we've been able to institutionalize um, the implementation or the integration of, of women, peace and security and gender based analysis plus um, as part of our core uh, uh, governance nodes. So what, what my colleague was talking about in terms of policy and training and um, a business planning, so the various areas, but also in terms of the um, the, the various institutions. Um, and, and so in terms of that structure, we've uh, had a gender advisor. So um, prior to me, <laughs> my colleague, Dr. Brown, and now me uh, acting as gender advisor to the commander, but also to the, the Canadian Defense Academy, and then a series of, of gender focal points. Um, and so in terms of the institutionalization of it, it's it's been really um, building the capacity of the gender focal points themselves to uh, to carry out that that work or or that thinking, and also um, building building the the cooperation mechanism. So to ensure that there is cooperation and there is sharing among um, among the network itself, so that um, we we are not alone in the work that we do. And, and that we are also not siloed in, in the work that we do because there is, there is much overlap. Um, and one thing I'll mention in terms of the, the success or the ability to do this has been, um, uh, driven by the buy-in and the support of the leadership and and the the different directors that are um supporting uh the work of the gender advisor and the gfps and i'm going to turn it to dr brown who's going to talk about the process for how how we're doing all of this thank you miss christine st pierre as as miss pierre uh, had alluded to um, we have been uh, so lucky to have uh, a gender structure now built within the Canadian Defence Academy, and the Canadian Defence Academy has um, has some ownership over all of the Canadian military colleges, and I'm going to speak to the perspective of the college that I work at is the Canadian Forces College, noting that there are others. Um, so within the Canadian Forces College, we have 13 gender focal points. And those gender focal points include as a lead gender focal point, our deputy commandant. We also have faculty members, both civilian and military, 
Uh, we also have librarian staff and we have curriculum development officers and we come together on a regular basis uh, to create professional development opportunities, not only for ourselves as gender focal points, uh, as well as the, the opportunities that are established by Ms. Christine St. Pierre as a gender advisor for CDA. Uh, but we also, we, we also have conversations about how do we really mainstream gender perspectives and in particular gender-based analysis plus uh, as well as equity, diversity, inclusion, and in the Canadian context, indigeneity within what we teach, the way in which we teach, and the context in which we teach it. So on the screen behind me uh, is our gender-based analysis plus lens. Uh, so in that lens, we have gender and sex as key components uh, to understand any groups uh, access to or limitations to resources, as well as their uh, risk or opportunities uh, within conflict and crisis, as well as uh, peacetime. So for the Canadian government, uh, we have a gender-based analysis plus model, as well as this lens that's federally mandated across all of our federal departments, including the Department of National Defense and Canadian Armed Forces, uh, and the plus is intersectionality. So because I want to make you active, how many of you here uh, have heard of intersectionality by a raise of hands? Okay, so we're middling. We have a, a significant contingent who haven't and a significant contingent who have. If you're already familiar with intersectionality, I would commend you to, uh, to, to look at uh, Canada's interpretation of that and see if that jives with what you know. Uh, and if you don't know anything about intersectionality and you'd like to learn more, I would commend you to look up Kimberly Crenshaw. She's been working uh, on intersectionality since she coined the term in 1989, um, but probably one of her, her greatest um, works on this was Mapping the Margins uh, in 1991. She also has YouTube videos for free, and she's an excellent uh, scholar and practitioner, so um, highly recommend. So for the in the Canadian context, we look at gender perspectives. We look at the different and often disproportionate impact of conflict and crisis for women, men, boys, girls, and gender diverse individuals. And we also use this lens to understand what women. We understand what women by taking a look at all of those other intersecting identity and experiential factors when we think about conflict, when we think about peace, and when we think about how to mainstream these ideas within our curriculum. So within Canadian Defense Academy, more broadly uh, and across all of the Canadian military colleges, uh, we use the same federal mechanism as, uh, as all the other departments to understand how to think about gender-based analysis plus in a systematic way. So this is one visual interpretation, um, but it really allows us to, challenges our, to challenge our biases, to understand what our biases are, to think about the assumptions that we bring to the table when we're thinking about peace and security, to think about who we are, we are collaborating with and who we are sharing the space with. So a lot of the, the, the conversation is about having a seat at the table. This is more about ownership of that table with diverse groups. So this is one visible visual representation. This is another, um, but really it's about change management within our organizations and mainstreaming women, peace and security, as well as gender and intersectional perspectives in the work that we do. So at the Canadian Forces College, I've been privileged to work there since 2015 as a sessional instructor, and now I'm an assistant professor, so I'll work there until I die. Uh, <laughs> Um, so along the way, we, we tried to figure out how we were doing this right and how we were doing this wrong. Uh, so in 2017, I was contracted by the college to do a large report on how we were mainstreaming gender and cultural perspectives within the joint command and staff program. So at the major to lieutenant colonel level. Uh, it's a master's program that we offer at Canadian Forces College. Um, and I did interviews uh, with staff, with students, uh, and I did uh, focus groups with uh, different communities within the college to understand what were the impacts 
of delivering this learning, where are we doing it well, and what were the gaps? And so from this, I had several recommendations, which are now areas that our gender focal point network are working on. And it's really about how do we understand what to include across all of our key components of our programming? Where does women, peace and security fit? How do we mainstream gender-based analysis plus? How do we consider diverse perspectives about women, peace and security, about security, about peace, about human security? And how do we ultimately come together as a community to work on this together? Because there are uh, a lot of uh, people who have never considered women, peace and security before as part of their curricula. There are others who have been considering this for a really long time. So we've been having conversations. So I realize that I'm a minute over, um, but some of the things that we've been able to do uh, is have professional development opportunities where uh, colleagues will come in and present what they know. Um, we also have uh, had asked for a survey of like awkward moments within classroom dynamics that had a gender component or an intersectional component where we uh, as faculty members uh, were unsure about how to respond in a way that was inclusive. And so we've had these professional development conversations about not only what we include in curriculum, but the dynamics that are going on in the larger learning environment, both within the classroom and beyond it. So if you'd like to hear uh, more about the report that I did, I parlayed that into my, uh, my PhD. So it is available online and it's completely shareable. Uh, we, mistakes were made, but also, also successes were made as well. Um, so I think I'll, I'll end it there. <laughs>